It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well. As I said on Sunday, it's good to be back in Madison. I'm thankful for the time to have been away a little bit to attend the Freed Hardeman lectures and to do some camping up north. It was a good trip. And I hope to see you again this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11 for worship. Sign on online if you're able to do that. We would appreciate it. And then I also hope to see you for the Bible class in between those services at 10 o'clock as we are studying Paul's first message or Paul's first letter to Timothy. And so it's a very encouraging letter. There's a lot in there. I think we're heading for 1 Timothy chapter 2 this week. So if you want to read ahead and be prepared for that, that's where we'll be this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. So the two services at 9 and 11, all of us can get together in between at 10. And so if you're missing somebody from the early service or the late service, uh, this is your opportunity to mix and mingle and to learn something about the Bible at the same time. So hope to see you this coming Sunday for that. Tonight we are continuing in our brief series of lessons on prophecy in the Bible. And of course in the bigger picture, as I explained a few weeks ago, uh, we are heading toward the book of Genesis in the very near future. But I realize we've just finished a very long series of lessons from Luke and then a long series of lessons from Acts. And of course, with Luke, we just finished a 21 plus year study of the entire Bible, basically on a verse by verse basis. And then we went to Acts, where we started back in April 2000. So that was our second time through the book of Acts as a congregation, at least with me being here. And in my mind, we needed just a little bit of a buffer between we jump back into another book of the Bible, especially a book like Genesis with 50 chapters. So we're looking at just this brief series, maybe five lessons or so on prophecy. And uh, we've had some questions about prophecy through the years, some very good questions, even over the past couple years. And so we won't be going too in depth here, but I do hope we can hit the highlights and to try to study some basics of Bible prophecy. And to help keep us on track and to give us a sense of direction and progress so that we could see there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm putting a very rough outline on the side of the screen. I'll try to keep that up there throughout the weeks that we're studying this. And so we're starting with the basics, a definition of prophecy, some examples or principles of prophecy. And then moving us on in the last maybe two thirds of this study, we'll be looking at some examples of Bible prophecy. And so some prophecies concerning nations and then individuals and then God's kingdom and then ending with some prophecies concerning Jesus. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. So we're heading towards some prophecies about the Lord Jesus. Uh, last week, by way of review, we defined some terms. So that's how we started this, not last week, but a few weeks ago before I left for Tennessee. And we started with that key passage in Exodus chapter 7, where God responds to Moses' objection that he wasn't a good speaker. And you may remember God fixes that problem by giving Moses Aaron as his prophet. And in that case, Aaron was basically Moses' spokesperson, just as the president has a press secretary, just as our local police department and our hospitals have public information officers. Uh, so also Aaron was to be Moses' prophet or his spokesman. And this is the meaning of the word. This is the role of a prophet. A prophet is a spokesperson, a speaker who speaks on behalf of someone else. He or she does not speak on his or her own initiative. Uh, but as far as the Bible is concerned, a prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. And so that's just the basic definition of that term. A few weeks ago, we also looked at the chart concerning all of the uh, prophets in the Bible. Before we get to that, I should mention that uh, very quick quote from 1 Samuel chapter 9, how prophets and seers were mentioned interchangeably. So we just need to keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, and so a seer is somebody who sees the future. A prophet who is someone who speaks on God's behalf. And so that's how that kind of became mixed. A prophet does not necessarily speak the future, uh, but he or she might. And so I hope that makes sense. It's not a de definitive answer on uh, whether it's uh, concerning the future or not, but sometimes they do speak the future. Other times it's just passing on a message from God. Uh, then we have the chart listing all the prophets in the Bible. And I made this in response to a question from one of our Bible correspondence course students a year or so ago. The PDF is on the Four Lakes website under articles, and that link was posted in the YouTube video of the class back on February 2nd. But I was surprised at the number of prophets in the Bible. I was not expecting to find this many. And I hope this list was helpful to you in some way. And again, it's not definitive. If you find errors in here, somebody who's listed who shouldn't be, or somebody that I missed, I would love to hear from you. But among some of the highlights and surprises, at least for me, Abel is a prophet. I never considered him to be a prophet, but he is described as being a prophet. Um, Abraham is described as a prophet. King Saul prophesies. Silas and Barnabas are both prophets. And we do have several women on the list. 
including Miriam and Huldah in the Old Testament, Anna and Elizabeth in the New, as well as Philip's four daughters in the book of Acts that we just studied a few months ago. And then we have several false prophets on this list. So I didn't know whether to include them or not. Technically, they are prophets in a sense. They are described as false prophets. So I kind of threw them in there too, just because the term is used. But it's a fascinating study. And personally, there were many more prophets than I was expecting. Uh, in our study, we are focusing on predictive prophecy. So not just speaking on God's behalf, but we're really looking at the part of this where where a prophet foretells the future in some way. So we're focusing in on a little aspect of this. And for this, we started by establishing some principles of prophecy. So by way of very brief review, since it's been a few weeks as to the timing of the prophecy, there needs to be some distance between the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy, enough that the prophecy is more than an educated guess. In other words, if I predict that it'll be cold tomorrow, here we are in February, that's not a real prophecy, is it? Because uh, the timing is uh, too close. I can predict it based on experience, based on uh, my time in Wisconsin. I know that today is February whatever, and tomorrow is also February. It's also going to be very cold. So there's got to be a little gap in the timing there. Uh, secondly, as to the details, a prophecy has to be specific. So uh, prophesying that a great leader will arise in the future. That doesn't do it, does it? Because anybody could be a great leader. That's too mushy. And we mentioned Nostradamus as giving some incredibly vague prophecies that don't really qualify as being prophecies. Uh, thirdly, as to the fulfillment of the prophecy, it must not be something that the prophet can affect. In other words, you know, predicting that this pen will fall to the ground 30 seconds from now, um, if that comes true, that's not a real prophecy because I control whether that happens or not. So that's not how prophecy works. Um, these are the kind of uh, essential elements along with, I guess we should mention, uh, accuracy. There can be no mistakes, zero mistakes. So it's not a it's not a case of making thousands of predictions. One of those happens to be true and the rest don't. And wow, that means I'm a prophet. That's not the way that works at all. So again, these are the essential elements. Uh, we added one more as something of a reminder that uh, that prophecy itself is temporary. And for this, we noted that passage in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, where Paul says that love is permanent, but the miraculous spiritual gifts like prophecy, uh, they are temporary. So we at least needed to note that going into this. So this brings us to tonight's study where we hope to start looking at some examples of biblical predictive prophecies, starting with this category of national prophecies or prophecies concerning nations. And so this is prophecy on a very large scale. And one of the first that comes to mind is the prophecy against Egypt. And this is found in Ezekiel 29 verses 14 through 16. And we studied this several years ago when we made our way through Ezekiel. And as I remember it, this was God's way of showing his disapproval of Israel turning to Egypt for help instead of turning to him for help. And so often today, when we're in trouble, it's very easy for us to go to some friend or neighbor or some external source or turn to our finances or, you know, whatever to get us out of trouble instead of turning to God first. And that's what the nation of Israel did. They turned to Egypt as an ally instead of relying on God. So we're not going to obey God here, but instead of getting conquered by whoever, we're going to go to Egypt and we're going to have them bail us out of that problem. Well, that's not the way God wanted that to go down. And so when we read this uh, judgment on Egypt at this time, we need to remember that at that time, Egypt was absolutely a world superpower, and it had been for many, many years up to that point. But this is what God says over in Ezekiel 29, verses 14 through 16. I will turn the fortunes of Egypt and make them return to the land of Pathros, to the land of their origin. And there they will be a lowly kingdom. It will be the lowest of the kingdoms, and it will never again lift itself up above the nations. And I will make them so small that they will not rule over the nations, and it will never again be the confidence of the house of Israel, bringing to mind the iniquity of their having turned to Egypt. Then they will know that I am the Lord God. Well, what makes this an interesting prophecy is that God, through the prophet Ezekiel, predicts the fall of Egypt back when the fall of Egypt would have been absolutely unthinkable at the time. This is back when Egypt, again, was a world superpower. And yet, not too long after this prophecy was made, this is exactly what happens. Egypt is reduced in size, uh, back to the land of their origin. They become a lowly kingdom, just as God predicts here. 
And even in the years since then, even up to the present day, Egypt has never again ruled over other nations, have they? They are no longer a world superpower. Nobody turns to Egypt to come save them from some huge problem. That's not who they are anymore. And today, Egypt is basically nothing on the world stage. They're, they're a nation, but just barely. And this was predicted by God at a time when Egypt basically ruled the entire world. Well, what happened to Egypt is very similar to what also happens to the Roman Empire, as predicted in the book of Revelation. And we don't have time to look at the book of Revelation in depth tonight, but my understanding of uh, the whole book, but really Revelation 18 in particular, is that God predicts the fall of the Roman Empire as God's uh, punishment for Rome persecuting the early church. And in that chapter, Rome is pictured figuratively as Babylon. Remember, uh, John is writing from the Roman prison island of Patmos and so on. So he's writing in this kind of uh, cryptic language, and it's something that the early Christians would have understood, a lot of Old Testament imagery. And um, uh, years ago, I, I saw an, an animated map showing the growth. It was like a video of a map. If you've seen those where the borders grow and shrink, and you see like how World War II played out and that kind of thing. Well, this was a, a map like that of the growth of the Roman Empire. And you could see those borders of Rome rapidly expanding through the years. And then peaking just a few years after the book of Revelation is written. And then shrinking until the Roman Empire falls completely. And of course, today we no longer have a Roman Empire. As I remember it, there's only one nation today that actually traces its uh, political roots, its political structure to uh, an old Roman Empire, and it is the tiny European nation of Liechtenstein. And, uh, you know, they are a, a tiny nation, and their claim to fame, at least a few years ago when I checked on this, is that they are the world's leading exporter of dentures and false teeth. And to me, it is an absolute, really a humorous fulfillment of prophecy, but it also proves to me um, that God has a pretty good sense of humor. So, you know, if you persecute, if you harass my people, I will destroy you. And I will take down your empire and I will turn you into the laughing stock of the world. I will turn you into the world's leading exporter of dentures. At least that's my kind of paraphrase of, uh, of Revelation chapter 18. But if, if you mess with God's people, he will take care of that. And that was kind of God's way of uh, prophesying the fall of the Roman Empire. And it's a very graphic description there in the book of Revelation. So... We've just very briefly looked at Egypt and also at Rome as two very quick examples, but the nation that we probably have the most prophecies about is Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. And Babylon is one of those ancient nations where we have some pretty cool artifacts these days. A lot of things have been found. Uh, the picture here on the screen was taken at the Louvre Museum in Paris back in either, I think it was the last couple days of 2007 or the first few days of 2008. I can't remember, it was that trip that spanned New Year's in 07, 08. And uh, this is a mosaic, kind of like bricks, colored bricks, a mosaic of a lion. And it was basically looted by the French from the ruins of ancient Babylon, probably in the early or uh, late 1800s, early 1900s is just my guess. That's when a lot of this stuff went down. But uh, these mosaics lined the entrance into the city of Babylon. They would have been there at the height of the Babylonian Empire uh, back when they were a world superpower, back in the days of the prophet Daniel. So this, uh, this mosaic was most likely seen by Daniel. Uh, when he ended up almost in charge as one of the leading figures in the Babylonian Empire. Uh, this next picture is a photograph of two artist renditions of the, the main drag, Main Street, into Babylon. And I've put a little yellow arrow on that picture in the lower right-hand corner there, where you might be able to just barely see those lion mosaics. And it's kind of just a blue blur. Those are the lions that we now have today. So this is an artist rendition. These are where those lions were found right along the main street there. And so we have this artifact. We have some documentation of some kind as to where it was actually found in the ancient city. Uh, they also have two of these lion mosaics in the previous picture, as I remember it, at the Oriental Institute. The Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, several times I've mentioned going down there and touring that museum. You can take a bus from here in Madison. You can then get on a Chicago City bus down to the museum. A little bit of walking is involved. Not that bad at all. But you can do that entire trip all in one day. I've done it at least twice from Madison, a time or two before that. I think the church in Crystal Lake where I grew up might have 
might have taken a field trip down there, if I remember correctly. Might have. I think we had a member who was a bus driver. We went down to one of the big zoos at one point. We might have gone to the Oriental Institute Museum at one time as well. Some of you have been there. If you haven't, I would highly recommend that. And um, if you have any interest in strengthening your faith and looking at some of those artifacts from Egypt and Babylon and ancient Iran and so on, I, I would highly recommend it. Wayne Jackson has a good article on the museum down there. If I remember correctly, he basically says, if you ever find yourself within two or three hours of Chicago, you have to go there. That, that is his recommendation. And his article summarizes some of the big finds that the museum has, those finds that confirm the biblical record. And I've used his article as something of a tour guide through the museum. So I just printed out his article, I went to the museum, I kind of checked things off, you know, things that he said were significant in the Bible and things you need to see. And so I would highly recommend doing that if you're able to do it. But I share these pictures just to remind us that Babylon was a real place and it was incredibly significant, very powerful back in its day. It would have been a major city similar to New York or London, Los Angeles. I mean, it was that kind of leading city in the world. It was a center of power and commerce in the ancient world. Um, at this point, I'll let you know that I'll be relying on some very good information that came in a two-part series of articles by Wayne Jackson. And Brother Wayne passed away, I think, just over a year ago. Um, but he was a, a good friend, a Christian brother and scholar and friends with both of his sons, went to school at Fried Hardeman with them. But he had a couple articles, Babylon, A Test Case in Prophecy, Parts 1 and 2. And I'll try to link those in the description. I'll, I'll give you the website there for Christian Courier, christiancourier.com. And just search for Babylon. You'll find a, quite a bit of information on there. But in Part 1 of the, that two-part series, Brother Jackson quotes a number of ancient sources. And he has the original sources in his office. He was reading directly from them. But uh, describing Babylon as being laid out in a huge square roughly 15 miles on each side, surrounded by a large moat, uh, more than 260 feet across. There was a river running through the city. Um, the city was then protected by a wall, uh, some sources say as thick as 75 feet, 75 feet thick for a city wall. That is amazing. 300 feet high. That's almost hard to believe. And so there are differing reports on that. Not all the figures are consistent in the ancient world. Some may be written by the enemies of Babylon who were kind of intimidated by that. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, a very, very high wall, 75 feet thick, 300 feet high. Uh, we also have some descriptions. Maybe you've heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I think that was created by King Nebuchadnezzar uh, because, his, uh, as I remembered, his wife was homesick for the mountains back where she, wherever she came from, where she grew up. And so he marries this foreign woman and brings her down to Babylon, which if you know, it's in the desert. It's flat. Nothing is there. And his wife is homesick. She, she, oh man, I miss those mountains. Okay, I miss the mountains. I can't, you know, I gotta go home. I gotta be by my mountains. Fine, I'll build you some mountains or whatever. And so he uh, creates the hanging gardens of Babylon, just this raised like a big uh, ziggurat, we might say, but just some uh, the hanging gardens of Babylon, flowing water, pumps. I mean, it was very technologically advanced for its time. And that was right there in the city. And that may be the patch of green kind of in the upper right hand corner there in the image on the right. Uh, but in the Bible, Babylon is described also as being a very large and important city at one point. I'll share a few of the references up here. Uh, some of these are making a contrast between Babylon's greatness and what was about to happen, the prophecy part of this that we'll get to in a little bit. So we'll come back to some of these passages. Uh, but I just want to share bits and pieces here at the beginning of our kind of peek into Babylon to illustrate that Babylon was at one time an amazing place. In Daniel 4, verse 30, for example, the king says, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Well, that's Babylon's king. He's bragging on himself there. But I'm just saying that's a biblical reference to Babylon being a great, huge place. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19, God refers to Babylon as the beauty of kingdoms the glory of the Chaldeans' pride. And so again, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of their pride. So it was a beautiful place. In Isaiah 14, verse 5, right there at the end of that verse, the prophet refers to Babylon as the queen of kingdoms. So it is a premier kingdom in the history of the world. Babylon is up there as one of the greatest. In Isaiah 51, verse 13, he refers to Babylon as you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures. 
So notice the praise of Babylon in terms of its uh, size and maybe its reputation, the uh, financial situation there. And in Isaiah 51, 41, he refers to Babylon being the praise of the whole earth. So everybody is praising Babylon. It has a, a reputation for being strong and powerful. So Babylon then was the headquarters of a powerful nation. It was a superpower at the time, the Babylonian Empire. But we also learn in Scripture that God uses Babylon to accomplish his purpose. So it's not that Babylon uh, pulled itself up by its own bootstraps necessarily, but God made it that way and used it for a reason. So in the big picture, after the death of Solomon, the kingdom divides, the northern kingdom of Israel goes directly into apostasy. They never turn back. God uses the Assyrian Empire to punish them by taking them off into captivity in 721 BC, and they basically never uh, really recover from that. On the other hand, the southern kingdom of Israel, or Judah, as they were known, they are not quite as bad. So they have some good kings, they've got some bad kings, and we've studied this through the years. And so for that reason, they last a bit longer. They aren't destroyed as early as the northern tribes. Ultimately, though, God uses the Babylonians to punish the southern kingdom for a period of time. He uses Babylon just as he used the Assyrians. And the first reference here is Jeremiah 25, verse 9 where Jeremiah prophesies on God's behalf. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord. And I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. So God is going to use Babylon to come in and punish the remainder of his people, the southern kingdom. However, just because the southern kingdom is being punished by the Babylonians on God's behalf doesn't mean that the Babylonians will rule forever. And I think we can read into it a few times and really not much reading into it at all, but Babylon goes overboard and they take a little bit too much pleasure in tormenting God's people and they're going to pay for that. Well, this next reference is from Jeremiah 50, verses 17 through 18, where God says, Israel is a scattered flock. The lions have driven them away. The first one who devoured him was the king of Assyria. And this last one who has broken his bones is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I'm going to punish the king of Babylon and his land, just as I punished the king of Assyria. And so again, we have this prophecy, God will use the Babylonians to punish the southern kingdom of Judah, but then God will also turn around and he will punish the Babylonians. So uh, this world's superpower is not beyond being completely wiped off the face of the earth. So they got a little bit too arrogant. God used them to punish his people, but they went overboard. And God basically says, well, I can take care of you too. So that's kind of where we're heading tonight. Uh, we have a detailed description of the fall of Babylon in Isaiah 47 and elsewhere. There are a number of places that outline this and give us various details. Uh, but Isaiah 47 is it's described in the heading as a lament for Babylon. So kind of weeping over Babylon. It, it's going to be bad. And remember, Babylon is a, a powerful nation when these words are written. It would have been like prophesying against Egypt many hundreds of years earlier. So they're this huge, powerful nation, and then there's this lament about how they're going to fall and how bad it's going to be. It's, and it's almost unbelievable. Uh, it's like talking about the fall of the United States today. Some have compared it to that. We, we just can't imagine that, or some can't imagine it. Uh, some of us can, obviously. Uh, but remember, a very powerful nation when these words are written. This is what Isaiah says. Come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil. Strip off the skirt. Uncover the leg. Cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered. Your shame also will be exposed. I will take vengeance and will not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name. The Holy One is his name. The Holy One of Israel, sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the Queen of Kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage and gave them into your hand. You did not show mercy to them. On the aged you made your yoke very heavy. 
Yet you said, I will be a queen forever. These things you did not consider, nor remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this, you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children, but these two things will come upon you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure, in spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells. You felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. But evil will come on you, which you will not know how to charm away, and disaster will fall on you for which you cannot atone, and destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly. So I know we have quite a bit of information here, and we don't need to go through it verse by verse, but I think the summary is that although Babylon thinks she is beyond falling, that is not the case at all. But in fact, God will completely humiliate the nation. And this chapter continues. And again, that same basic prophecy is found elsewhere as well. Uh, not only do we have a general prediction like this concerning the fall of Babylon, but we also have some specifics as to the timing of it. So remember, part of our kind of basics of, of prophecy is there has to be a gap in the timing. And for this, we turn to Jeremiah 25 verses uh, 8 through really 13 and 14 and beyond. And um, it's in the middle of a larger passage, so it's kind of hard to know where to whack this. Oh, but we're focusing on the timing here. And Jeremiah starts by addressing the southern kingdom. He tells them what will happen and when. And then he makes this prediction concerning the Babylonians and when their time will come. So this is Jeremiah 25, starting in verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about. And I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings will make slaves of them, even them, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the work of their hands. And I know we didn't start with verse 1 in this chapter, but in the very first verse of this chapter, Jeremiah gives us the exact year that he's making this prophecy. He says, The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And then he continues. And so I'm just saying we can date this prophecy then exactly in world history to 605 BC, which is nearly three quarters of a century before the actual fall of Babylon. So it's very specific as to the timing of the fall of Babylon. Not only do we have specifics as to the date of the fall of Babylon, but we also have some amazingly accurate specifics as to those who would do the overthrowing of Babylon. So that's amazing. Not only do we know the date of their fall, we know who's going to do it. And the first reference on this comes in Isaiah 21, verses 1 and 2, where the prophet says, The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea, as windstorms in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness from a terrifying land. A harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously, and the destroyer still destroys. Go up Elam, lay siege media. I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused. Well, at the end of verse 2, we've got the reference to Elam and media. And these are the ones who would be attacking Babylon. But I would emphasize, at the time this prophecy is made, uh, these places were nobodies on the world stage. Nobody was afraid 
of Elam and Media, and yet they would be the ones who would ultimately overthrow the almighty Babylonian Empire. So not only do we have the nations that would do the attacking, not only do we have the timing of the fall of Babylon, but we also have the actual name of a ruler who would be involved in it. And this next reference comes in Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 8. And uh, this one comes hundreds of years in advance. And so again, there's this huge gap going back to our basics or uh, fundamentals of prophecy. So there's a gap in years. So many years before it actually happens, this is Isaiah 45, 1 through 8. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden wealth of secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor. Though you have not known me, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. And so this is rather detailed. God, in the future, will call on Cyrus. And then we have the details as to exactly what Silas would do or Cyrus would do. And we have, we, again, we could spend several days on this. We've cut this short already, but we at least have the summary here uh, that God calls the invading king by name. King Cyrus would be the one who would be doing this on God's behalf. In addition to the actual fall being predicted, as well as the timing of it, the nations who would do it, and the king's name who would do it, um, 200 years before he was even born, we also have some information concerning how the attack would happen, how such a powerful nation uh, would be unexpectedly brought down. And we can confirm this through uh, secular accounts of the fall of Babylon and secular history by Greek and Roman historians. Uh, I'm skipping over uh, many of the details in scripture, but I do at least want to notice the unique way in which Babylon was conquered. And the first reference here is to Isaiah 27, verses 27 and 28. Isaiah 27, 27 and 28. It is I who says to the depth of the sea, be dried up, and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Well, it's just an interesting uh, reference connecting the drying up of rivers at the end of verse 27 to God's blessing on Cyrus at the beginning of verse 28. And it's interesting because that is exactly how Babylon was conquered, through the drying up of a river. Uh, we have a similar prophecy in Jeremiah 50, verse 38, where the prophet in the context of the fall of Babylon says, A drought on her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is a land of idols, and they are mad over fearsome idols. So notice, the drying up of waters is tied to the fall of Babylon. And then we have another similar reference in the next chapter in Jeremiah 51, verses 36 through 38. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am going to plead your case and exact full vengeance for you, and I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals an object of horror and hissing without inhabitants. And so again and again, we have references to the fall of Babylon being tied to water drying up. Sometimes these references are years, decades before it ever happened. And from secular history, we know this is exactly how it went down. If you remember, even from your history back in high school or college, there was a, a huge river flowing through the city. Well, to conquer the city, the enemy soldiers dug this canal upstream and they diverted the river away from the city of Babylon into some marshland, allowing them to actually go under the wall undetected where the river once flowed. And so instead of scaling this 75 foot thick wall that was 300 feet tall, they simply drained the river and went there. And they went under the wall in the riverbed. 
And so these references to the waters being dried up in connection with the fall of Babylon, they were true in a way that nobody ever could have predicted or even imagined. Otherwise, the people of Babylon would have prepared for that and they would have been ready for that, but it was completely unexpected. Uh, we don't have time tonight, but there are a number of passages referring to um, drunkenness being associated with the fall of uh, Babylon, and that was absolutely the case. Uh, drunken feast going on, and so those prophecies are fulfilled in that. There are other references to it happening like a snare, and you know if you've ever used a snare, how quickly that happens. An animal goes through that little wire loop or whatever, and it is it is over in a hurry. So very quickly, without warning, and uh, all of these prophecies are confirmed by secular history. So tonight, then, we've looked at several examples of biblical prophecies being made and fulfilled. So some very just brief references to Egypt and Rome, and then we've obviously gone into quite a bit more detail concerning the uh, Babylonian Empire. If you want to know more, I would highly recommend looking at christiancourier.com. That's a website now uh, maintained by a friend of mine, Jared Jackson. So just go to that site, christiancourier.com, and simply type in the word Babylon in the search bar up there. That's what I did that led to the screenshot that's on your screen there. So christiancourier.com, and then just search for Babylon. And uh, that'll direct you right to the, those two articles specifically about the prophecies concerning Babylon, these two articles that I've referenced a number of times tonight. Uh, but then the other links further down deal with other passages and some very interesting evidence uh, concerning Babylon from the field of archaeology. And Wayne was so good at that when he was alive. Uh, this seems like a good place to pause tonight. Hopefully we can pick up next week by looking at some prophecies concerning individuals. So some personal prophecies, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen there, we're, we're working our way through, we're making progress, there is hope, we're, we're heading in a good direction here, we're coming to the end of this, we're, we're halfway through. And again, I hope to see you this coming Sunday for worship, either at 9 or 11. This would be a great time to sign up online if you haven't done that already. Hope to see you at 10 o'clock as well. Uh, that's our time to all of us be together in the middle as we continue looking at Paul's first letter to Timothy. So I think if you read 1 Timothy chapter 2, you'll be pretty well prepared for our class this coming Lord's Day. Uh, as we come to the end of tonight's study, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us these prophecies that we've studied tonight. We're thankful for Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the others and for the great courage that they had to speak up on your behalf even giving some devastating prophecies against some very powerful nations. We're thankful for the accuracy of those prophecies that we've studied. We're also thankful for discoveries that have been made in the Middle East in the fairly recent past, giving us even more confidence in what we read in your inspired word. Our faith doesn't depend on what we dig up over there, but it certainly doesn't hurt. And we're very thankful for the hard work that continues to be done even at this very hour. Tonight, we pray for our members who are struggling with their health. We pray for Abe and John. We pray for those who are struggling emotionally and dealing with some very heavy burdens in life right now. We pray for caregivers. We pray for those who are overwhelmed at school or at work or just with life in general. We pray that you will give all of us wisdom. We pray for wisdom specifically on behalf of all who are in positions of authority, as your word has directed us to do, so that we could live quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. This is our prayer. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for our Christian friends in Ukraine today. We pray that you would keep them safe, that they would be a shining light during a very difficult time. Tonight, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our Almighty King. Amen.